Welcome to this presentation on examining culture through a liberal arts mindset, created for business students by three George Washington University professors of language and culture and made possible by a grant from the Teagle Foundation. To start, we need to get a handle on what liberal arts means. Liberal in this context isn't about politics. It's about a way of approaching learning. In the book, Rethinking Undergraduate Business Education, the authors identify four modes of thought crucial to fostering an independent, critical thinking individual. The first two modes are ones that business education programs are already quite good at. They're practical reasoning and analytical thinking. The other two modes are multiple framing, so dealing with inconsistency and contradiction, and reflective exploration of meaning. That's involving interpretation even when there appears to be conflicting information or purpose. These last two modes are more typical of fields within the humanities, so the study of literature, religion, history, etc., as they don't always have a straightforward formula or black and white answer. Instead, they require a great deal of interpretation, self-reflection, and flexible thinking. It's this kind of learning that we hope to inspire through this approach. Now, business programs can benefit from greater attention to these modes, not instead of, but in addition to practical reasoning and analytical thinking, because in today's global environment, business people work in less predictable contexts. They manage or work in teams with people from a wide variety of backgrounds and belief systems. They have to be able to think on their feet, view situations from multiple perspectives, and adjust decisions accordingly. And the goal is to support divergent thinking. So professors in foreign languages like us help students gain cultural competence through knowledge of the language spoken by the people in that culture. Language, what people say, how they say it, when and why they say it, can tell us a lot about people's perspectives, beliefs, and their value systems, and what they deem important. In other words, their culture. There are many aspects of language that we could look into, just like through a window to observe culture. But we've chosen to focus on an approach that's both fascinating and fun, through the field of paremiology. What on earth is paremiology? It's the study of proverbs. It's a subfield of folklore studies, and it's studied by anthropologists, linguists, historians, and literary scholars. Proverbs or sayings are like many literary texts, and they're often creatively worded, and they pack a load of cultural meaning into just a sentence, or sometimes even less. Now, maybe the notion of proverbs seems quaint and old-fashioned to you, and many of them are indeed pretty old, but their age doesn't keep them from being used regularly. Both new and ancient proverbs are still used regularly in everyday speech. It's time for a pop quiz. Let's test your knowledge of a few proverbs common in American English. So provide the end to each of the proverbs as I read it. Look before a bird in the hand. Practice makes people in glass houses. If at first you don't succeed, Make hay while no pain, no think globally, garbage in. Now, I'd be willing to bet you got all of them. These proverbs are so common that we only need to say the first part because it's assumed that people will get the meaning without having to hear the whole sentence. Now that you've got your proverbial juices flowing, we're ready to dive deeper into paremiology, the study of proverbs. Here are the goals for this presentation. In part one, we're going to define the term proverb. What is it? We're going to dig into the language of proverbs. We're going to find out the many roles that proverbs can play pragmatically. And we're going to check out what proverbs can reveal about values, norms, and attitudes of a culture. And through it all, we're going to realize how common it is to use proverbs in everyday language. Later on in part two, you're going to get the chance to analyze several specific commonly used proverbs from other cultures and interpret these proverbs for a reflection of their business culture. How do we recognize that something someone says is a proverb? Well, first of all, it's a distillation of collective experience in the history or geography or the social life of a culture. It's also passed on knowledge or experience and values of a particular culture and it's grounded in oral tradition. These are characteristics that are key to defining what a proverb is. So what about the language of proverbs? Proverbs share linguistic hallmarks, language features that, well, make them sound like a proverb. These include being succinct. They're short. 
They also often rhyme. They have alliteration. They have a poetic rhythm. They often bring in some kind of aspect of a person or personification. They're full of hyperbole or exaggeration. And they often show a paradox. We could add one more here, something like, it sounds like a proverb. That's harder to put your finger on, but in formulations like, where there's X, there's Y, or no X, no Y, or he who X's is Y. Now, why are proverbs worded this way? Well, the answer is simple. They're grounded in oral tradition. All of these linguistic hallmarks make them easy to remember. In the field of paremiology, researchers have found it challenging to come up with a short, concise definition to capture all the aspects of what proverbs are. But here's the best one that I could find by a man named Wolfgang Mieter, a top proverb scholar. A proverb is a short, generally known sentence of the folk which contains wisdom, truth, morals, and traditional views in a metaphorical, fixed, and memorizable form, and which is handed down from generation to generation. Or, as Lord Russell put it, the wit of one and the wisdom of many. Now let's dig a little bit deeper into proverb language by analyzing semantics. Semantics is about meaning, but even that can be broken down further. First of all, literal meaning. Meaning is direct and it's not implied. So an example of that would be, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. That's pretty literal. But there's also metaphorical meaning, where meaning is indirect and interpretation is needed. An example is, where there's smoke, there's fire. We're not really talking about smoke or a fire, but it's metaphorical. Let's talk about the pragmatics of proverbs. That is all about interpretation. Like semantics, it's about meaning. But instead of being about literal or metaphoric meaning, it's about doing things with language. Here are some of the pragmatics that proverbs allow us to do. They can allow us to give advice or encouragement or cast judgment a little bit more gently than saying it very directly. They allow us to offer a self-defense or a justification. They also carry more weight in a discussion because the entirety of a culture's beliefs is behind you. And they allow us to add color or humor to something that we're saying. Let me give you an example of a proverb in use. I went to a diner for breakfast with my friend Jeff the other day, and he ordered a sesame bagel. A few minutes later, the server came back to tell him, we're out of sesame. She gave him other options. You could have cinnamon raisin, garlic, poppy seed, or everything. Jeff said, huh, I think I'll have everything. You only live once. Was Jeff telling me that I'm mortal and will someday die? No, he was using a proverb to, well, to justify his choice, uh, but of course also to be funny. What if, though, I had said to him, go for the everything bagel, Jeff, you only live once. I'd be offering encouragement and, of course, also trying to be funny. No matter how you use the proverb, you're using it to express your values in some way. Proverbs can give us insight into culture that permeates many areas of life, from music to politics to business. They're so steeped in our culture that we can even mess around with them a little bit. These are called anti-proverbs. And actually, they're only funny because we all know the original proverb and think it's funny to poke fun at the cultural values they're expressing. If at first you don't succeed, take a nap. Some proverbs are shared across cultures. For example, they're shared through cultural history. Biblical proverbs are often the same across different cultures. Do unto others, for example. And there are proverbs we've adopted through direct contact with another culture, for example, through immigrant or refugee communities. So there are a lot of things that we can learn about a culture from its proverbs, but caveat emptor, hey, that's a proverb. At the same time that they're self-reflective, traditional, and consistent, they're also overgeneralizing, ever-changing, and contradicting. Take, for example, this proverb, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Contrast it with out of sight, out of mind. So proverbs often contradict each other. Even that says something about a culture. There are also potential problems with proverbs. Older proverbs often reflect outdated worldviews, underscore stereotypes, or manipulate. At the same time that we can learn a lot about culture from proverbs, analyzing and interpreting their semantics and pragmatics, we should also avoid overgeneralizing. 
In fact, paremiologists, proverb scholars, discuss this question a great deal. What is the connection between proverbs and national character? Here's an important quote that sums it up. Perhaps one of the most treacherous but yet fascinating areas of folklore scholarship concerns the potential of folklore for studies of national character. Do the proverbs of a people contain in distilled form the essence of their philosophy of life, their worldview? Comparative folklorists are invariably wary of assuming that a proverb, normally found in more than one culture, necessarily expresses national character. Anthropologists, in contrast, are often more likely to believe that the proverbs collected from their people or village do in fact reflect local ideology. Probably the truth lies somewhere in between. So proverbs don't explain culture, they give insight into culture. Here we revisit the notion of the liberal arts mindset. Proverbs help you develop skills in multiple framing, considering potentially different perspectives at once, and reflection, interpreting before, during, and after any action to become a more divergent thinker, doer, and leader. What can proverbs teach us about how people from a particular culture do business? For example, how they create organizational structures, how they value work, how they reward or compensate it, how they serve clients in their companies, the ways that they interact with coworkers or with their superiors, and how they handle interpersonal conflict. Think about this common American proverb, which often comes up in business contexts. For someone from a different culture, what insights could it reveal about attitudes about how business is or how it should be done in the US? About management structures, about the value of strong leadership in a project, or about the potential drawbacks of teamwork. There are many aspects that could be explored, just from one short proverb. You're now armed with knowledge about paremiology, and you're ready to analyze some proverbs from other cultures. We invite you to continue to the next presentations, where we'll explore several proverbs from three different cultures, Arabic, German, and Korean. We'll be looking for the following things. The literal meaning of some proverbs, how or what do these words mean? We'll also explore the figurative meaning. What is the folk wisdom that's being expressed with the proverb? We'll explore whether or not there's a corresponding proverb in English. And we'll look for insights into the culture. What can this proverb teach us about how people from the culture do business in these cultures? Thanks for joining us for this presentation, which was supported by a grant from the Teagle Foundation. We look forward to seeing you in part two.